for the astute in the audience, uh, you might have noticed an oversight that uh, uh, our next speaker, Kenny McElroy, does not actually have a bio in the program. That was our bad. We're really sorry about that, man. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't pay attention to what he's about to say. Uh, so we appreciate you putting up with a, a few little hiccups. Uh, uh, Kenny's going to do something a little more in the physical space, which is uh, uh, really exciting. Uh, it's interesting. It's interesting. I do say that all the time, don't I? Like, all the goddamn time. It's interesting. Uh, <laughs> A lot of folks that I know, uh, um, their hook when they got into computer security was the physical side at first, right? There's something visceral about opening a lock or opening a door or something like that that makes you realize that the world around you doesn't work quite in the way that you thought it did and doesn't, you know, your expectations were different than reality. Um, and that helps kind of level set you and, and your thinking when it comes to understanding the more complex problems like the large scale computer systems we deal with and that kind of thing. So uh, I looked at Kenny's talk, it looks very interesting. Uh, that's Said, you still only got 20 minutes, so uh, good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give a hand to our M MC. This is awesome. Thanks for the applause. <laughs> so my name is Kenny McElroy. I know it looks like McElroy. It's kind of weird, but that's how it works. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about some access control systems. I know it, the talk is titled, uh, uh, what is this, Implantable Logic Analyzers. We'll get to that part. It's exciting. It comes later. So just hang in there. Uh, generally, talking about access control systems because so many people use them at their corporations and there are so many problems with them still. I know it's kind of a dead horse, but it, it hasn't died. We keep beating it, we keep talking about these issues, but they're not being resolved in a timely manner, so we need to keep on pushing to make people aware of what those issues are. So um, I do stuff. Uh, I actually kind of got into security the opposite direction of what he was just describing. Uh, I started uh, doing systems administration. I got in through the software side of things. Spent about 20 years at systems administration and was getting a little tired of the same old things. So I started uh, adventuring into the hardware world and found it really fascinating and a lot of fun. So that's where I've been playing for the last few years and, uh, and happy to be there. So uh, yeah, if you're working on stuff that seems like it's related to the list of items on the screen there, um, come talk to me, I'm interested. So again, what I'm talking about primarily is access control systems, uh, generally how they work, what they're, what they're made of, how they're put together, uh, some of the really awful ways that they can be bypassed, I'm seriously awful ways, and then something a little bit new, and that's the ESP key. So access control systems, and this is probably review for most of you, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here describing what they are. Um, but of course, it's when you walk up to a door and it has some sort of card reader or some sort of user interface where you punch in a code or something, and that communicates then with a controller on the back end. Usually a controller will have uh, you know, maybe two or three, maybe two or four doors that are hooked up to it. Um, but eventually, there's also some sort of mechanism which prevents the door from opening. That's usually an e-strike or a mag lock. And uh, then there are a couple of sensors involved in the situation. One of them is the door open sensor, which can detect whether the door is closed or open. Pretty straightforward. Also, the exit sensor. So what if the door opens from the other side? When somebody's leaving, it can't tell the difference between that as an authorized door open versus somebody forcing the door open from the outside unless it has this exit sensor. And usually that's a, a passive infrared motion sensor or something similar. All this stuff makes sense? Cool. I see lots of heads nodding. You're awake. That's weird. Weren't you guys drinking all night? Come on. OK. One person. Deviant was drinking all night. There we go. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> OK, so we're going to jump straight into the trivial bypass techniques. There are so many of these. I'm not going to be able to talk about all of them in 20 minutes. I'm going to try and spend about five minutes here, and then we're going to move on, OK? First one, the magnetic read switch. This is the most common way of determining whether the door is open or closed. This is how we find them. Uh, most of your smartphones have a magnetometer in them. That's how they tell which way is north. You can use that to tell which way is the magnetic reed switch because it operates with a magnet coming into close proximity with a magnetic reed switch. So far, so good? OK. I know I'm talking a little bit fast. I'm just trying to get through tons of material fairly quickly. 20 minutes, woo! Uh, so you can use your smartphone. You can use a compass. Or if you have an actual handheld magnetometer, which I do because, you know, it's fun. Uh, they're kind of expensive, but if you have one of those, that'll certainly work too. Very easy to locate. You don't have to see anything. You can just m use a magic wand and wave your way around the door frame, and you can find out where the switch is. In order to bypass that switch, what does it take? Not a whole lot. 
just about any old kind of magnet you can find, there are some really thin, like one millimeter thickness, 50 millimeter diameter or smaller. Uh, these work great. You can slide it in between the door frame and the door, and then suddenly the door frame doesn't know whether the door is open or closed anymore. Then you can do whatever you want to the door. This is bad, right? There's got to be a better way. So there are some other switches out there, but pretty much every single one of them has its own issues. So wouldn't it be nice if we had some better sensors? That's in the to-do list somewhere. I haven't seen anybody come out with anything really great that I th think is very effective. If you have, come tell me, I'm interested. So now we're gonna talk about the passive infrared motion sensors that are used for the exit sensors. So this is when you walk up to a door and you wanna open that door, but there's some sort of uh, mechanism that's keeping it locked. Um, this switch is going to trigger and allow you to open the door. Great, no alarms, yay, that's awesome. Except that these passive infrared exit switches can be triggered many different ways. Many different ways. Uh, how do you find them? Well, pretty much every door has one of these sitting, you know, generally it's mounted up above the door on the inside. So if you can see through a glass window, you'll be able to find it pretty easily just by looking. You can also hear it when somebody walks by the door. You'll hear it clicking pretty often. Usually they have really industrial strength relays in there. They're super loud and snappy. Uh, so they're pretty easy to pick up just by sound. To get past them, there are so many ways, I'm not even gonna list them all, uh, but you can read through the list there yourself. And um, somebody came to me one time and they asked me, okay, so basically the idea is you just have to get a bunch of heat that's moving fairly rapidly underneath the sensor, right? And I said, yeah. Well, what if you were to, are, are you saying then that you could, you could pee on the door and it would open? <laughs> I think that's really weird, just saying. But the logic is sound. <laughs> Have I tried it? No comment. <laughs> so <laughs> another thing that's really interesting is if you walk up to, a, to one of those big double glass doors uh, and they're really pretty and there's no latching mechanism anywhere to be seen, how does it work? Well, generally in the, the, the top edge of the glass door is gonna have a, uh, um, what are these things called? A maglock. Uh, as you can see in the bottom left of the screen. Uh, and this is just a giant electromagnet. When it's energized, it's really hard to pull the plate away from it so the door stays closed. Some of them are rated for, you know, 2,000 pounds or more. Uh, so you have to put a lot of force in it to break through that magnetic force. Cool. Um, but then how do you actually open the door if you want to leave? Generally, there's a little metal bar, and if you're touching that metal bar, even though it doesn't move or anything, as long as you're touching that metal bar, then the door's unlocked. So that's a capacitive touch exit switch. Anybody who's physically touching the bar trips a, a sensor that's basically inside that bar and, uh, and then unlocks the door. Well, do you have to be touching it from the inside? It can't tell. So anything that you can feed in between those two glass doors and then make contact with that metal bar, boom, that's gonna do the job. So what can you use? Well, metal hangers, you know, all kinds of different things. Anything that's a decent conductor, basically, that comes into contact with that bar and is touching you, you're a great capacitor, is going to trip the, the sensor and the door's gonna unlock. So for exit only, well, you know, sort of, not quite. Okay, is that interesting? Is this kind of boring stuff? Interesting. Interesting, cool, good. I want to be, you know, uh, reviewing a bit, but also kind of addressing maybe some, some techniques that you're not familiar with. But at the same time, there's really cool stuff too, and so I'm gonna just jump away from all of this, this trivial bypass and go straight into something new. Uh, this is the ESP key. This is the first big conference public appearance for the ESP key, uh, so there aren't a whole lot available just yet. But if you're really interested in one, come talk to me. Uh, why the ESP key? Well, so there are a lot of other devices out there on the market already, and what they're doing is they are interacting with the, the RFID transaction, uh, or in some way capturing it, or cloning, or, or doing something cool with the RFID, and that's between the card and the card reader. So stuff that's over the air, and that's cool because that means that you don't have to touch anything. Okay, that's cool. But there's a bunch of different devices out there. Some of them are kind of challenging to use. Some of them are pretty easy. Generally, the idea is you walk up to somebody and you kind of look like you're grabbing their ass, but you're actually swiping this thing next to their wallet, which is in their back pocket, and then you can be them. Cool. Um, but what if you don't want to be that close to somebody? 
there are other ways. Uh, at Black Hat, Eric and Mark uh, were talking about the BLE key, and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Generally, the idea is you pop open the card reader or remove it from the wall, and then there's these wires hanging out there, and you just clip onto the wires, and then suddenly you can be capturing all the data that the card reader has and is sending back to the access control system. So I thought, well, that's pretty cool, but I don't know, the BLE interface, not quite my favorite. I'd rather have something a little different, so I built one based on Wi-Fi using the ESP8266, thus the ESP key. So let's see if this magic button over here works. Do you see a thing? What's the number? All oh, right, okay, it's live. Uh, so what we have over here is just a generic access control system with a single card reader. By the way, huge shout out to Baba Chavadi of Red Team Tools letting me borrow this fantastic demo unit. So the idea here is if you swipe a card, After it's booted up, it takes about 30 seconds. Sorry, I forgot about that. Then theoretically, the lights would turn a color, meaning that the door is unlocked and you can exit freely or enter freely. So this is normal usage. But wouldn't it be interesting if, um, if we took it apart a little bit, figure out what's behind the magic? I was a little bit surprised to find that it's only one screw to pull this thing off the wall. Does that surprise you, anybody else? No, not at all. I will not repeat that, but uh, very entertaining, thank you. So inside what we have is just a bunch of wires, right? Well, it's talking a very simple protocol. It's called Weakened. You can look it up later. Uh, so we're just going to punch down a little uh, device to it and see what happens. Of course, I didn't get out of the bag in advance. So where do you know what time it is? Okay, so this is my first time installing it on this device, which, uh, gosh, I forgot to cover the screwdriver. It's a little bit sharp. Whoops. And if nobody puts the screw back in, is anybody going to notice? It's still going to hang on the wall just fine. I mean, how many people look at the underside of this thing and, is there a screw in there? I don't know. One person, okay, cool. I, you can come, you know, work at any office I work at. That, that's cool. <laughs> so what are we looking at now? 4.43. 4.43. Time. Oh, that's, that's an important thing. And, uh, huh. Kenny, to point out, you didn't cut the wire, so the system, you just bridged it. Right? Cool. Yeah, so I'm just clipping a device in line. Uh, and you heard the card reader beeping a whole bunch, and that's just because the buttons were being pushed, because I was being careless about it sitting on the table.
And this is the part of the live demo that fails because everybody's doing bad things to Wi-Fi. Oh. Really? Successfully activated. Oh hey, there's a the thing. So right now it's just capturing data. And uh, let's try swiping that card again. So here's this last swipe. Hopefully that wasn't important to anybody. What happens if we hit replay? It turned green. Oh, right. So now I'm going to hit replay again. And the green means that the door is unlocked, of course. So is that what everybody's seeing is I uh, hit replay and it goes green? Three, two, one, replay. Yeah. So over in this log, and this is actually um, being stored to flash, so if you go and retrieve this device, it has the complete log of everybody who logged in or everybody who swiped in. Uh, and you can go through and uh, say, oh, I saw somebody walking down the hall and their badge number was something else and they looked like they might have access to everything, maybe a security guard, something like that. So you just click on the ID and you change the ID. And it keeps the facility ID the same, which generally is going to be the same for everybody at a facility. A lot of interesting stuff in the just simple web user interface that works pretty well on a smartphone. Are there questions? Oh, I'm on there. Wrong screen, sorry. Not very well yet. Um, but that I just punched in one, two, five, eight, nine. Other questions? How much will it cost? Hundred bucks. Uh, so generally they are just sending weekend data as well. So we can capture it and replay it. Oh, the question was what about biometric readers? Um, same goes for two factor. So if you have uh, you know, a pin and a card or a pin and a thumbprint or a pin and whatever, it's all talking weekend. Uh, so the option that you have at this point is to use a different protocol or to encrypt the weekend and that's what OSDP is for. Uh, there's one device on the market which will allow you to use your old gear and uh, start using encryption with it. Uh, it's not all that great. Um, the, the environment is not super awesome. There are some se serial protocols for doing basically the same sort of stuff, uh, but there's not enough encryption here in the wire. Anybody surprised by this? <laughs> not really. Yeah, business as usual. Anybody think this is a bad thing? Yeah. 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 Me too. Well, so I think the comment is, well, we're expecting physical security to be good between the card reader and the, the controller. Uh, so the controller is actually somewhere else, you know, in a closet somewhere in the building and could be hundreds of feet away from the card reader. Uh, so there's a lot of cable that you have to secure. Um, but also just the card reader itself, there was one screw in order to remove it from the wall in order to get access to the wires. So the physical security option is not actually all that good. There are tamper switches that allow you to identify whether a card reader has been removed from the wall, but pretty much everywhere that I've seen doesn't use that feature. If it is used, it goes into a database somewhere, so it gets logged and somebody could look at it later if they wanted to, but it doesn't trigger any alarms. We can also defeat the tamper. Oh, of course, it's easy to defeat the tamper switches. They're all garbage. <laughs> Other questions? On cards, I don't know. That's uh, this talk is more about the card readers, uh, which is totally different ballgame. So of course, if you're using encryption between the card and the card reader, uh, that makes it more difficult to clone with a proxmark. But it doesn't matter for this tool because this tool is looking at the card reader to back end, which is pretty much always unencrypted. Do you
Yeah, so just a clarification from Deviant is that uh, if you're using crypto between the card and the card reader, you're still looking at plain text, just ones and zeros, from the card reader to the controller. Uh, and it's usually a 26 or a 37 bit number. It's very short. So we can store a whole lot of them in the four megabytes of storage on the ESP key. Do you happen to know if most of the controllers make uh, logs that are easily uh, watchable by something like Logsash? Anything like that that maybe would make it easier to set up an automatic trip? Uh, right now, maybe we do that. Right, so the question is, uh, are there convenient ways of, um, of getting data from the access control systems to something that is easy to watch and uh, to monitor effectively. Uh, easy ways, no. Uh, with someone smart who has the right color of hair, sure, it can be done. Um, but nobody's doing it, nobody cares, basically, is, is what I've observed. Uh, and generally, we're talking, you know, Linnell systems that are so hard to get functioning that, yeah, nobody's going to spend extra time, extra time trying to make it actually usable. Okay, one more. Make it good. Uh, I saw a hand wandering around over there. Yeah, yeah. So generally, most of the access control systems use a backend database that are, is keeping the, the ACL as well as the logs. And so you can just scrape those databases, but it's a hassle. Yeah. Thank you all so much.